So just moving on to our agenda for today, um, we are delighted to be able to um, introduce Rose McCarthy, who's a new member of our program team, and she's going to be giving um, an introduction to di digital innovation within the NHS. Um, that's just going to be a brief introduction, and um, we can have any comments or questions following that before moving on to Neelam Solanke, who's an assistant psychologist within the iFry program, giving some top tips for remote learning, uh, remote working. I could perhaps do with some of the top tips for remote learning <laughs> um, that have come out um, of some quality improvement projects um, that we've been supporting through the National I Thrive programme. Then we're delighted to welcome our colleagues, Laverne Andrebus and Rachel Humphreys, who are going to be presenting their work on Level Up, Safe Steps to Secondary School, which is a programme that they had to very rapidly translate into um, a digital intervention. So we're really delighted to be able to showcase their work today. So thanks very much for that, to them for coming along. And also we have NHS Digital and NHS England and Improvement. And we have a few colleagues, Nadia, Hilary and Emma, who are all going to be um, carrying out a bit of a workshop with us to think about um, the work that they're doing and how they might be able to support sites in um, some of their uh, challenges in delivering digitally within the current context. So we will have an opportunity for Q&As at the end of the session, so that's about 20 to 12, and um, uh, we'll be aiming to close on time at a midday. And we will be asking for a little bit of feedback. As, as we all know, these are challenging times, and it's really great to get any comments, both um, constructive, uh, con constructive criticism or feedback around how we might be able to do this differently and improve the way in which we deliver these webinars um, and any other types of feedback you'd like to give us. So um, please do stay on to give us that really valuable feedback at the end of the session. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rose, um, who can introduce herself and take us through some of the, um, well, the introduction to today's session. Thanks so much, Rose. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, hi, I'm Rose McCarthy, and I'm a programme trainer with the National I Thrive program team and I'm just going to give a very brief introduction to some of the kind of digital innovations that the NHS have been using. Um, so as we're all aware we've recently undergone a huge shift in our working in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've had to adopt digital technologies to enable our service delivery and the speed at which we've been able to respond to this shift has only really been possible because of most of the technologies that we've used were already well established although they weren't widely used in our services. We are, however, in the very early stages of digital transformation, and many of the technologies that we use are replicating the face-to-face -face processes rather than transforming systems to become different digital. Here, we're gonna have a look at some of the technologies that are in the forefront of the digital healthcare delivery. So, um, yeah, sorry, could you go to the next slide, sorry. That's perfect, thank you. Um, so here, thinking about smartphones and wearables, such as a Fitbit or Apple Watch, um, nearly four out of five of us have a smartphone and 95% of young people aged 16 to 24 do. And a lot of these have uh, been marked as health or wellness aids rather than medical to avoid the kind of regulatory requirements that are associated with this. But there are, however, great potentials for smartphones and wearables to be used more in the NHS, such as a wearable heart rate that to be monitored um, at home over an extended period of time rather than a kind of one-off visit to a surgery. Through the NHS app, it is now possible to book appointments, to check medical records and to order repeat prescriptions. And as more services integrate onto the app, that our care can become more holistic with multidisciplinary care provision. The development of Cooth has also been a great resource for children and young people accessing mental health support by keeping them connected with their peers and counselling. And apps like this are drastically reducing the waiting times and they're improving access to services. They're also reducing the stigma about mental health by encouraging everybody to talk about it and be part of the bigger conversation. Smartphones and wearables can offer a huge amount and can collect a huge amount of data that if shared with research groups can offer a rich data pool in which to base the outcomes of our interventions on. Clearly there are limitations to these such as identity uncertainty and privacy, but there is a huge potential for development with these um, at these wearables. 
Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So now thinking about with the virtual communication aids. Now, telemedicine is something that we've all seen a huge shift in the use of this in response to COVID-19. And this is mostly replacing the face-to-face -face contact that we've had previously. But there is potential to develop this further by enabling colleagues to join in these virtual sessions for their learning or for consultation. And it also has the capacity to build more partnership working and holistic care provision in order to support shared decision making between a child and young person and their family and the professionals that are involved. Digital therapeutics are an evidence based interventions that are delivered virtually through a smartphone, laptop, tablet, for example, and they embed the clinical practice um, and therapy in a digital form. So, for example, somebody may be prescribed an app that incorporates self care advice alongside virtual CBT. And this type of therapy can reduce the waiting times um, to be seen face to face and can also increase uh, the access to services for those that need them, whilst given a tangible measure of improvement. Computerized CBT has been available throughout the NHS for a long time now, but the success of the intervention was fairly limited, and that's mostly because of the participants not completing the course. So technological improvements are being made to the design of the program and more specialized courses have been developed such as Sleepio to help improve insomnia and thus reducing anxiety and depression. So moving therapies such as this to digital platform means accessibility to services is greatly improved and the waiting lists are reduced. Again, outcome data can be analyzed to improve uh, inform our improvement. Um, next slide, please. Thanks. Whilst we can see that there are so many exciting developments in technology that can enhance our health and care service delivery, we have to remember that there are people behind all of these technologies. And through digital innovation, we've developed peer-to-peer -peer support networks. So MedHelp, Patients Like Me, Health Unlocked, they're all examples of social networks for health. And they help people staying connected to support each other globally to manage their condition. There are also some closed clinical groups on Facebook, but there are clear monitoring issues that need to be kind of managed with these. And groups such as these can reduce to the stigma associated with mental or other health conditions by opening up the conversation with a wide group of people. They're also helping to share a common language between everybody to increase health literacy. Data donors are something that's emerging now, which is really interesting, which is people volunteering to share their data with research teams to build a rich data source on which to build their findings. And this can go towards developing more services to meet the changing needs of the communities that we serve. So this very short presentation, we've had a look at some of the digital technologies that have aided our service provision over the past few months. What I think I'd like people to take away from this is to think about how we can use te digital technology to really enhance our service provision. Things like reduction in waiting times, you know, large data pools for research are clear winners with this digital innovation, but we're all aware of the value that face-to-face -face work brings to a lot of our service provision. So looking forward, I think a blended approach um, is, is hopefully going to be very likely in the work that we do. And I'd like you to all just have a real think about how we can use these digital technologies to enhance the services that we're providing. So um, I think that's me done now. I think I'm handing back to Rachel. Great. Thank you very much, Rose. That's really Thank helpful you. overview of um, the range of innovations that I'm sure people across the country have been using over the past nine months or so. So um, now we're going to move on and um, hear from Neelam, who's going to give us some top tips for remote working that have come out of a number of quality improvement projects that have been delivered through the programme. So over to you, Neelam. Thanks, Rachel. So, yeah, as Rachel said, um, I'm going to give some top tips for remote working. And um, before doing that, um, sort of go through the quality improvement projects that Rachel mentioned. So at the Tavistock and Portman, um, in, I think, sort of April time, we embarked on a trust-wide remote working project, which was um, based on improving the um, user experience, so service user, but also staff member um, of remote working. 
And um, so we had various different teams across um, the three divisions and across DET. Um, and I think we had around 15 projects overall. So Beth and I supported with seven projects within um, the Children, Young Adults and Families Division. Um, and so each team kind of thought about how they could best uh, improve the service and make sure it's as good as it can be according to their, their particular service needs. Um, and as well as this, one key outcome measure that was measured across all teams was the rating of the service using this 1 to 100 scale, which was devised. Um, so as you can see, it goes from 100 being the most superior, so a remote session, which would have ordinarily gone on face-to-face, -face, actually being better than a face-to-face -face appointment, um, and then sort of trickles down at various different levels of um, uh, quality. Um, leading to impossible, not conceivable to work in this way due to, you know, a number of reasons, but technology can't hear that sort of thing is, is what this is based on. So this scale was not about the quality of the content of the session. It wasn't about the relationship between a therapist and a service user. It was more to do with the, um, the, the unique um, sort of difficulties that remote working might bring. Um, so thinking again about technological things, connectiveness and how this differs uh, moving on to remote means. Okay, so um, within the National iThrive Programme team, we would, um, we decided to so not do the QI project in full, but we thought it would be an interesting exercise to, to measure each of our meetings, which might have ordinarily been face to face. So within this, um, we're not a service user facing um, team, but we do have some interaction with um, PPI team. So for example, we um, use this time to sort of further the development of our animation, which I know a lot of you will have seen, um, which we were able to sort of do remotely when they were ordinarily and would have ordinarily continued to be face to face. Um, so we measured every interaction, like I said, that would normally have gone um, face to face. So team meetings, these animation, larger partnership board meetings and, and also COP events. So, you know, events such as this, we held one back in, our first one was back in um, June, I think. And um, that would obviously have been one of our large events that we held, you know, twice across the year that a lot of people would have attended. Um, and thinking about how they, they kind of compared to, to um, how they would have been done ordinarily. So as you can see, um, scores were generally quite high. There were glitches and these, um, you know, speaking from experience, these, these were down to internet connection, meaning that um, trying to talk to someone and it cut off or um, can't hear because there's problems with audio or, you know, the, the, a real range of stuff. But overall, they're, they're fairly high, especially sort of 13 weeks onwards to 17. They were high 80s to 90s, meaning that they were as good as face to face and we'd really got into the swing of things, which after 17 weeks and since March, you kind of hoped that we would as well. Um, but yeah, we, we found that there were a few things that we could employ to make sure that remote working was as, um, you know, was as good for us as it could be. So um, in general, the individual scores uh, range from 11 to 95, with 11 being extreme difficulties that completely meant that the session had to come to an end, to 95. So um, high quality is good as face-to-face. -face. Um, whereas weekly scores, the average ranged from um, 11, as you can see in week eight, where there's that yellow circle around the one huge outlier that we had, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a second, to 95. So uh, thinking about the last few weeks there, where everything just went well. Um, so as I said, there is an obvious outlier in um, week eight, um, when this was due to an uninterrupt, uh, due to an unscheduled interruption in our session, um, which we hadn't accounted for. So the learning from that really is to ensure that security for remote sessions, which we, you know, which aren't going on face to face is as good and is as tight as um, sessions which would ordinarily be face to face. And, you know, we are all learning and we are all adapting to these new means, but um, yeah, it's, it's taking every step to make sure that security is as good across. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a summary of the QI remote working project. And through this, we all fed back to, uh, within the sort of quality improvement group and the trust and were able to put out some themes. Um, but through the work that we did together as a program team, we were able to sort of come up with 
eight top tips and considerations. And I, and I appreciate that this may feel um, a little bit, you know, reductive considering how long we've had to all adapt to working remotely. Um, but we, you know, moving forward, we've been able to make a real considered decision on, um, on how we, on, on our practice moving forward. So if I talk a little bit to each of these top tips. So the first being consider the time and cost implications of travel. Um, so within the National Ithro Programme team, a lot of time, you know, in terms of delivering training or events with sites across the country, and that being the key sort of phrase here, across the country, meant that, um, you know, the team were on a lot of 6am trains to Manchester and so on, and, and uh, to deliver an event and then try to rush back, which obviously is a huge time pressure. And um, there are cost implications as well. We have to work things out with budgets. So with these large scale events, or even with these, you know, smaller training events across the country, um, it's been easier to, to sort of arrange them and to hold them over Zoom because everyone is, is within the comfort of their own office, their own area, and um, also more able to find a time that works for everyone because you don't have to factor in the time it takes to travel somewhere or booking a room and all these sorts of things, especially now with COVID where you'd have to factor in um, social distancing measures and the max capacity of rooms. So I know that when we were trying to plan a COP event when things were a little more unclear about um, how many people there could be, it was, it was quite difficult in thinking about different risk assessments and all these sorts of things that you, don't, you wouldn't have to ordinarily do over Zoom. That being said, um, the, there's a real importance in trying to balance the face-to-face -face work, work with uh, remote meetings. I'm sure we all have experienced and are continuing to experience uh, Zoom fatigue and, um, you know, the, 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 the thought of, of logging on for a day and then knowing that from 9am until 5pm it is constant, it is one meeting after another of, of Zoom and just staring at a screen and, and you know, all of the, the sort of horribleness of having to deal with that. So, so it is important to try and schedule in face-to-face -face work where possible and where safe. So something that we've really tried to do within our team is to, um, again, as much as possible to meet for um, our team meetings, our weekly team meetings um, in the trust, in the office. And so within that is making sure, again, that we can book a room that's big enough for, um, for us to be able to distance ourselves socially, considering in the masks and the trust policies. And again, just trying to, to work around things to ensure our sanity more than anything and also to like ensure that level of connectivity that we have to each other because I'm you know I'm sure you all know that it's it's much easier to get stuff done when you're face to face and having these conversations and able to bounce off each other because that is something that zoom poses challenges for it's you know you never know whether you're going to interrupt someone you know and then there's the whole sort of etiquette about muting yourself and unmuting and and yeah it, it's more difficult to have a conversation over Zoom. And so face-to-face -face work is still really important and, and Rose did allude to that earlier too. So prioritizing Zoom security as ever is, is as I mentioned, um, hugely important. Zoom meetings do need to be kept as secure as face-to-face -face meetings would be because we're all working, you know, with, within, um, within healthcare and mental health and, and with, with vulnerable populations and, across sectors where we're trying to champion the needs of, of, of service users. And so it's, it's you know, it, it's confidential work that we're doing a lot of the time with some, some details that, that shouldn't be shared to people who aren't directly involved. So prioritizing Zoom security is really important. And Zoom does have a number of features that allow you to do this. So you all know that you were sent an individual registration link to access this meeting. So due to GDPR and Zoom itself, it was an email to the team where you get your link where you register to enter. And then obviously um, we've got sort of people within this meeting admitting people appropriately and then ensuring that they are people that have registered to the event. So, so making sure that, you know, if you, you are where you're supposed to be and that other people who you might have, who, you know, haven't, who aren't meant to be there aren't basically. Um, so moving on, so number four, choosing your Zoom account type accordingly. So there are a number of Zoom account types. We've got the standard free one where um, there's the 40 minute limit uh, for more than two participants, which um, has been a learning curve for everyone because it's it does the job, but it's a bit tricky to have to, you know, log in every few minutes. Um, and then we have Zoom Pro, which I know a lot of organizations and sites have begun to use now. Um, and then Zoom Webinar, which 
um, is what we're using today actually, where we can have panelists and we can have different hosts going through, um, you know, going through to make it as smooth a process as possible. Excuse me for one second, my cat is scratching at the door. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so again, as I mentioned earlier, breaks are completely, completely paramount to the success of Zoom and to your overall mental health and well-being. Um, I think there's been, you know, the guidance from uh, different organisations is normally to finish a Zoom meeting sort of five minutes before the hour, but we're all very busy workers with, with lots of things to do. Um, so it's it's kind of down to the onus is, is on us as individuals to make sure that we do put in these breaks for ourselves, that we do try and th finish things early, that we do schedule in our calendars times to 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 do desk work, to to you know to have lunch, to have that lunch break, and make sure that we're away from our computers, and to to really really focus on us and practice some self care and. You know, I think one of the more emerging themes from working on Zoom is that um, people that there's there's a blurring of boundaries, and that people are you know starting earlier or working later, and definitely working through breaks. And it's it's ensuring that we are kind to ourselves and really do prioritize that. So number six, considering potential technological issues, um, as you know, internet, uh, sound not working, webcams being worse than they need to be and all these sorts of things so internet is the bane of everyone's life I think that unstable internet connection box that comes up is fills me with dread definitely <laughs> and um, I'm going to assume that's the same for other people but um, it's having you know kind of measures there so ensuring that you can try to access email to if you're able to to let your team know and putting things in the chat of sorry I'm gonna have to turn my video off because it's not working for me and I want to be a part of this um, I know that within our team, if, if we're having a technological issue within a meeting that we're having, it's, it's, a, it's a really quick text on the WhatsApp group to let everyone know so that they can tell the rest of the people, you know. Um, so it, it's trying to mediate where possible, but sometimes it's not possible. Internet will differ according to homes, but also it's, it's sometimes a bit shaky within the trust itself. And it's being, you know, understanding of these issues that can arise. Um, so being agile and getting creative are, are quite linked in a sense. So um, I mentioned with the animation earlier that we were a bit stuck about what to do moving forward because the participation from the uh, children, young people and families in creating it was, you know, the, the sort of pinpoint of, of the animation itself. Um, but we were able to continue this over Zoom and we're able to do it really, really well, actually. Um, so it's, it's ensuring that you kind of the work that can happen over Zoom continues to happen. And then the work that you thought might be impossible. For, so for us is doing community practice events because they were these two huge events um, in a year. It's it's trying to, to find another solution. So as you know, we've got our monthly webinars now and um, we feel that they're working well and they're, they're fun for us. They're really, um, you know, we get a lot out of it and we hope for other people too. So um, I whizzed through those top tips and key considerations. Um, hopefully it's something that other people can relate to and just something to consider. Um, so yeah, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Neelam. And Carol's put in um, uh, the, uh, in the Q&A about um, ensuring that meetings are scheduled just off the hour or half hour to ensure that you have time for a comfort break. And that's something I'm trying to do with my diary too, make sure that um, hour long meetings are 15 minutes to give yourself that time. So thank you, Carol. We should um, add in any top tips. So I did put in the chat um, if anybody would like to um, pass on additional top tips from your work. And we're very mindful, of course, that um, whilst that presentation was about the use of Zoom and we're using Zoom today, that Teams is, an, is the other um, uh, way of working remotely that um, certain parts of the, um, the world uh, that we're in now need to use rather than Zoom. So um, acknowledging that. But um, Anita's um, also added um, that comment uh, within the um, chat so thanks very much for that um, and um, so thank you Neelan please do uh, continue to add any additional top tips we could always um, we could collate those and put them out onto on the website so that um, they're then uh, an evolving uh, way of passing on um, shared learning from uh, your, all your experiences um, which have been are going to be very varied and really fantastic learning to share so really fantastic to hear that and Carol <laughs> Nice to introduce your pets and uh, 
Um, <laughs> could you share your name of your cat, Neelam? Because uh, Carol's keen to um, promote the modelling of always introduce your pets to the audience. <laughs> My cat is called Bertie. He's a seven and a half kilo beast and he's very needy for attention. So sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. But a very good point, Carol. So yeah, always introduce whoever passes by on the back of the screen. That's really important. Thank you. Okay. Uh, please do add any uh, additional thoughts in the chat. It'd be really fantastic to hear um, from, from you guys about your experiences. And uh, um, we can collate those, as I say. So now it's time to move on to our next presentation. So I'm delighted to be introducing Laverne Andrebus and Rachel Humphreys, who are going to share their experiences of delivering Level Up digitally. I'll hand over to you guys. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, Rachel. Um, morning, everybody. Just so you know who's who. I'm Laverne, um, child and educational psychologist. And I'm Rachel, um, nurse and systemic family practitioner. In the team. OK, and we, we will um, introduce anybody who decides to come through the door behind us if we know who they are. We're actually at the Tavistock together today, which is um, you know, quite a nice thing to be able to do, to be able to come together and, and do this presentation. So we're going to take you through um, how it's been for us to try and put together a programme for young people in year six, moving to year seven. And I suppose I'm sort of struck by, Neil, and what you were saying, you know, about the top tips. It feels to me as if you took us through a whistle-stop tour of all of the different emotions and ups and downs that we had during putting this programme together in this way. Because it's no mean feat, I think, really, to to suddenly, as we all have, find yourself in this moment, in COVID, having to adapt our ways of working. But absolutely, we hope that you'll get a sense of what we've been able to do and, and the responses of the children, young people and their parents as well. So just to give you a bit of background, um, we're a programme that's funded by the Youth Endowment Fund. Um, if you Google YEF, you'll see that they're very much about um, early interventions, um, youth crime, criminality and our program was, was really about how how did we relate to um, this idea given our clinical experience and the sorts of encounters that we're having with children and young people we we're um, evaluated by the Anna Floyd Center which is great um, they in a rather blind way chose us so apparently all of the programs were put on the table um, a number of evaluators came along and read them and they chose us. So there we are. We're a sort of happy partnership in that. Um, so to say something about what our vision was, um, at the point at which we're writing the bid, you know, we live in London. Everybody in our team lives in London. We are very much affected by what we hear and see in the media. You know, our streets seem, seem very, very worrying. Um, and I suppose that was part of the motivation for feeling that this was something that we wanted to have a chance at getting involved in. And I think for me, um, it was about the sorts of encounters that I have in London, those that I have in real time and those that I feel I might have potentially. So at the point of writing it, I was thinking, well, how is it for young people seeing the news, hearing about you know, people being affected by crime and then having to make that amazing transition from the sort of security and small base of most primary schools into the big world of secondary school. You know, the first time that you perhaps get the bus to school on your own, you're not having your parents drop you. And so our program was really about supporting children through this transition as they move to secondary school. Um, that was at the heart of some of the thoughts that went into the bid. And what we wanted was to make sure that children had the sort of right toolkit, really, um, the equipment to be able to do this. We wanted them to be able to have the social and emotional skills that they would need to sort of navigate their way through this time and feel that they were connected to the safe and supportive and um, engaging aspects of their communities. And again, you know, these are interesting words, but they were really central to what we felt was important. We knew, um, and you'll hear about how we've had to be quite agile in changing things around, but what we knew was we wanted children to have an opportunity to work with us, 
but really at the heart of it, to be able to be able to step back into their communities, knowing that there was something within their community that they could be feel very close to, connected to, um, and they could relate to. So in, in many ways, you know, writing the bid was about recognizing something around the attachments that children have to primary school, you know, having to move away from that. How do you then move through and build a new attachment with your secondary school? I'm not sure if we're watching mm -hmm. the, the video now, but um, we go to... Yeah, I have to play it now. Thank you. A sneak peek. <laughs> Sorry, the... Uh bars in my way. There we go. Level Up is all about helping year six pupils with their move from primary to secondary school and making it as easy and as successful as possible. Hi, I'm Natalie. Hi, I'm Rachel. Hi, I'm Jamie. Hi, I'm Jessica. And I'm Laverne. Welcome to our programme, Level Up Safe Steps to Secondary School. done on finishing another session. We've covered a lot. Thank you. Madam. Okay, so that was a, a very sort of quick peek at what we did. Um, it sort of takes my breath away when I see it. Um, and a big shout out to you, Freddie Peel, who put that together for us, um, who's been supporting us throughout this program um, in the business development unit. Um, and I, I suppose, yeah, I sort of feel like I need to sort of slightly recover from that because that was the journey. Um, and you got an impression of the sorts of things that we were sort of doing online with children and how, how we managed to get a bit of learning about them. So the team, as you can see here, is a, is a mixed team. Um, we're very keen to have a, a range of professionals. So Rachel's our nurse, um, clinical and educational psychology in the team. Jamie is our art therapist and our an amazing sort of um, administrators as well, who really help us along the way. And I'm just going to take you through this timeline now um, to give you a sense of, you know, this journey that we, we went on. Um, so we, make, we were putting the bid together in the summer and then around November time, we won the bid. Um, you know, that sort of heart, heart in mouth moment um, when it all comes together and you think, Oh my goodness, it's actually going to happen now. Um, but we thought we thought quite carefully about the authorities that we wanted to be working with, um, who we already had established relationships with. And so we, we plumbed for Camden, Harringay and Islington. Um, and, it, and it was a really sort of exciting time to be building something right from the very start. Our recruitment process was, as I've said, very, very mindful of wanting a mix of professionals, um, because we were going to be embarking on designing this program. We wanted to really have 
a sense of all the different layers that we might need and all the different sort of um, standpoints that us as different clinicians might take about what we needed to be um, putting together for the young people. We decided that we would have um, as the strands that would run through the programme would be about moving from personal to school to community. And again, um, I can't say enough, you know, we were very clear this was a short term programme and we didn't want children and young people and their families to feel that they would be um, alongside us for a very long time. We, we recognised this was a short intervention. So we had to leave them in their community. So that was at the heart of how we thought about everything. Um, transitions being at the, at the sort of forefront and uh, how did we think we wanted to put this together in the form of a booklet. We had these very sort of big ambitions in the beginning before COVID-19 um, of going into school and um, running groups in schools. Uh, we, we, we knew how many schools we wanted from each authority, how many children in each group, and we built in enough flexibility so that if we weren't always able to run groups in school, um, those children who perhaps couldn't make the group experience would be able to offer them and their parents something. Uh, alongside it. So this is, you know, our plans as we started out. Um, but then, of course, we hit the bumpy road of COVID. I think we knew it was coming in January and February as we were hearing the sort of world news. Um, never quite sure about how it was going to, how it's going to land with us. But we were very close to having our booklet completed. Um, we had um, done extensive work to link up with professionals that we needed to in the local authorities to make sure they knew about us. And I have to say, everybody that we did encounter felt very, very positive. I think the conversation about youth crime is a very complicated one. Um, it's, com it's complex for a number of reasons because of the sorts of children inevitably that you know, are thought about when we think about those words and the sorts of schools that we would have been involved in. And so you know, I think within our, within our, within our team, we've had some quite, um, interesting discussions about that but we we were pretty much ready to go and then I think as we sort of came through March and felt that sort of impending moment of knowing that um, we were going to be going into lockdown we were a bit pre-warned because actually most of the schools had started to say to us we're not sure that we can have you in um, you know we're beginning to feel that sort of rumble of noise which means that we're having to get our acts together quite differently and we're really not sure that we, we can do this. So we had to be quite agile in our thinking. Um, I'm not sure where that agility came from, if I'm completely honest. Um, maybe a moment of madness to think that we could actually do this, but that was the moment at which we thought, this is gonna have to, we're committed to this. We want this to work. We're a new team. We're really wanting to meet these children. We're gonna put it online. And so, you know, those very, very simple words became the reality um, in terms of the negotiations we had here around whether or not we really could show that sort of agility, talking to the YEF. I remember thinking, well, we'll just do it online this year. And then when we're through the pandemic, we'll go back to our original plan. But actually the YEF, I think probably very importantly said to us, if we're going to evaluate this, if we're going to see whether or not we've got some rigor in this, we need to keep it online for both of the years. We're a two year funded program. And so that was a little bit of a, a moment um, because you know we're clinicians who are very used to being in the space with um, our clients, our patients. And so to suddenly commit to a digital forum, um, something new to all of us felt like a, a huge commitment, but it meant that we had to think about you know, feasibility. How are we gonna make this work? Could it work if, if we thought we could make it work? Would the children have devices? You all have been um, party to the conversations in the media about you know, devices and who had connectivity, who had Wi-Fi. You know, all of those things suddenly felt as if we would be maybe not able to get to the children that we wanted to get to. So huge, huge question marks for us around that. And also the risks. Um, and it's interesting you know, to, to Neil and Rose to talk about these things previous to us, you know, huge risks. We've never done anything like this before. Um, you know, it's pretty difficult having a phone call session. Um, that, that was sort of my entry level, you know, in terms of that patient um, relationship when somebody does, can't come into the clinic. Okay, we'll talk on the phone. You know that that sort of creates a bit of a barrier. How was it going to be if we were suddenly going to be doing it in this way? 
And then I think the, one of the biggest tasks at this point was who was going to do this for us? <laughs> um, we couldn't do it. You know, we certainly, um, I, you know, I definitely know when my clinical skills lie, they do not lie in design um, of online activity. And so we put out a tender and we found um, a collective who we felt really understood something of the products that we wanted to put together. Um, and they were really interested in the idea of moving something that we really thought about and cared for and nurtured and looked after. How could they take that up and put it online for us? So that takes us to May. Um, so at this point, um, we had to we knew we would be doing something online and that we had a um, design agency working with us, but we hadn't even met them yet, um, even remotely. Um, so we had to kind of say to the commissioners and the primary schools that just sort of watch this space, that we would be doing something. It would be remote. Um, we didn't know what it would look like, but please have faith in us and wait for us, um, which was quite scary. Um, and also as we're waiting just for things like the... Um, everything going through with collective and the money and you know everything kind of being in place we we just had to use that time to convert our booklet into what we thought would be an online activity we didn't know whether it would be feasible or not but we just sort of had to take a bit of a leap of faith um and we decided that we would have hopefully online activities um alongside zoom um group sessions which is kind of what we were hoping to do when we were in the school so we, we settled on that idea and thankfully collective were um, great in that respect and they really let us um, kind of come to the, our first meeting with an idea of what we wanted, scripts and all. Um, and we met with um, Youth and Downfront and, and the Anna Forest Centre um, remotely. So everything was remote now um, over Teams and also had our first meeting with Collective over um, Teams as well, which, you know, there was just like seven people from a design agency in the room with all of us and it was just, it was a um, unique experience. Um, and also part of their bid was that we would do co-production sessions, which we felt was really vital. Um, and we were able to enlist a group of year six, year seven students um, from not within the boroughs we were working with. Um, and it was our first, that would be our first um, taste of whether, you know, it could work, whether they would be engaged, whether we could do um, these therapeutic groups over Zoom or not, and whether they liked the, um, the activities. That was May. So then we got through to June. Um, and it was a very fine balance of kind of saying to the primary schools that we need and the commissioners that we need um, all of our SDQs back, which were what we were using to identify students to take part um, by the end of June, because the end of July we were starting the group. So it was like down to the wire. Mm -hmm. It was intense. Um, and, you know, we were also aware of the fact that we were talking to teachers who like would ring reception it'd be the head teacher manning reception or you know you'd be speaking to senkos and they'd be at home they were obviously re you know experiencing something they'd never experienced before so it's like we didn't want to pressure them but also we knew that they wanted the children to take part they had children in mind so it's all done you know securely but remotely um which was a unique experience for us as well sort of emailing over the sdqs and then they were sending it back securely and it was um yeah interesting um, and that we were continuing to develop, so we're running the co-production sessions, um, and from that we, you know, it was a wonderful experience. We'd never, I personally never had um, had worked over Zoom with children before um, in any capacity, so um, it was great to actually see what that was like, and that they were wonderful, and you could really felt like you were starting to kind of, to build a relationship with them, which kind of a bit of precedent for what it would be like when we were running the groups, um, and they were just amazing. The feedback was just so funny mm -hmm. um and yeah that was it for june so i got to july sorry i'm out of time um so july was again down to the wire um we were contacting parents they'd never spoken to us they didn't know who we were really so obviously they're given permission for us to speak to them so we were having to um ask them for i guess for the first ever time we were having to speak to them over the phone. So we're encountering things such as having to use interpreters or the family members were asking them for, you know, quite personal sensitive information because we were doing, um, explaining the, the um, groups, but also um, asking them for their referral information. So this is all quite um, different. And we're having to very quickly kind of get some sort of, um, you know, engagement and develop some sort of relationship with them, which went surprisingly well. 
Um, although we did find at that point that was our biggest drop dropout rate was those who had been approached to take part in the programme but hadn't spoken to us yet. Um, and well, so yeah, just it was we were doing that at the same time as developing the activities, planning the groups, enrolling everyone, consent forms, everything happening at the same time, um, doing SoundCloud things. Um, yeah, it was a lot, a lot going on sort of at the same time as preparing them for the group. Um, and at the end of July, we started running the groups and then August. Um, so it launched technically the last week of July, but we launched the groups um, at the same time as not wanting to make us sound unprofessional, but we're still developing the group <laughs> sessions um, as well as actually encountering the joys of um, remote working. So we were helping people get on the internet sometimes, helping them to get onto the programme, helping them to get onto activities, helping them to get onto Zoom. Obviously some families were very proficient, but others needed so it was varying levels of support. We were um, having a mixture of sort of family, friends, helping translate for some parents. And, you know, we, we also saw the incredible strength of the families and young people we were working with and the resilience and that they were, we were talking to parents in the shop. We were kind of Zoom sessions in the garden with the children sometimes. And it was, um, it was, it was amazing and, and how adaptable they were that we were sort of, we had to use a lot of, sort of emailing, texting them, um, invites, reminders, the children, it was, it was full on um, and same time sending them sound class and organizing the art groups which Jamie ran which were amazing as well um, and yeah it was um, it went very well it felt um, it was really interesting experience we managed to work um, two practitioners to each group and we came into the Tavistock we decided to do that to run the sessions which really we felt was very beneficial and um, I love every minute of it it was such a wonderful experience and the feedback that we got was really positive as well so we were we felt um relieved by the end of it after all that hard work <laughs> okay Thank you. so um i'm it's bethan from the national ice thrive program team I'm just going to speak about how the um how the level up program aligns with the thrive framework for system change because we're collaborating uh, with the Level Up team to co-produce an implementation story. So thinking about how this work is, is Thrive Aligned and it, it really, really is. So um, on, on this slide, I'm going to speak to how it aligns with two of the uh, two of the needs based groupings. So you'll see on the left hand side, we've got the thriving needs based grouping. And in this grouping are children who are particularly vulnerable to a range of social, environmental and individual factors. And thinking about the criteria for children to be a part of this program, which included being under the radar of statutory services, having a strengths and difficulties questionnaire SDQ kind of score of between six and 18, struggling with peer relationships, having more kind of taking more risky um, behaviours or uh, poor decisions and with have parents who are worried about the transition from primary to secondary schools really kind of identifies this vulnerable population and thinking about how the programme can um, think about providing proactive prevention and promotion strategies to to get them through this transition so um, we heard a lot about the kind of what was involved in in that programme from Laverne and Rachel um, so it, it really does kind of align with that providing support for the thriving needs-based grouping um, and as we, um, as I said, the evaluation will also think about how, like the effectiveness of the program as well. So kind of watch this space because um, we'll uh, be delighted to kind of update the implementation story that we're writing to include this, uh, to include the findings. Um, and then also we've got the getting advice and signposting these space grouping. And I know that the work kind of connecting with the community um, kind of resources and services um, was slightly hampered by COVID. Obviously, it's quite impacted by that, but there was a lot of work that um, that the team did to kind of build those relationships and also kind of share with the families that they were working what was available in their communities and uh, resources that they could draw on. So. Um, yeah, so thinking about the best ways to support their mental health and well-being and then also the transitions into into secondary schools and a key aim for the program going forward into its second year is thinking about how to maintain and also build those relationships as well further. Um, if we go on to the next slide, Neelam. 
Thank you. And thinking about the kind of the key principles of the Thrive Framework, it really aligns with partnership working, which is one of the, the main principles of the framework. Thinking about the different networks that have been kind of engaged with and are involved, thinking about education. Obviously, this is kind of a health provision, but it's it's a multidisciplinary team that are going into this, well, delivering the online programme. And then also engaging with families and also their uh, communities. So thinking, building on the strengths and uh, resources of their communities as well. So there's a lot of kind of engagement with the system to enable this program to, to happen. And um, a testament to the relationship building um, that's already happened with the primary schools that were involved in the first year is that many are also willing and very, very happy to be on board and be included in the second year of the program as well. And um, thinking about the programme being very needs led, that a lot of co-production went into the online delivery kind of element with the different sessions that were happening to kind of shape the content and look and feel of the online programme. So um, the voices of children, young people and their families was absolutely core and um, integral to the, to the online programme and um, shows that the offer is incredibly needs led as well. And I just wanted to share some of the feedback uh, from the co-production session. So you can see how it is kind of needs led and the, the kind of influence that the children and young people had on the program. So um, one, one of the comments said that didn't mind the amount of text, but reduce the amount on each page so that it doesn't feel so overwhelming. So really kind of concrete guidance as to how to, to help the program be more engaging to children and young people. And then also the fact that there was a lot of kind of um, kind of learning even through the process. So um, thinking about um, one young person commented that they learned he was part of more communities than he originally thought he was. And then also that there were wider network um, available to support them as well. So thinking about, OK, one one person said that they learned that they could talk to many more people than just the police as well. So brilliant feedback that there's kind of that wider engagement. And um, yeah, so that's a brilliant kind of outcome from the programme. So we're just going to hand back to Laverne and Rachel, who are going to just talk very briefly about the, the next steps and then and then we'll have a break. Um, I will speed through this bit of it because I'm aware of time. Um, so this is just a, I guess, a compilation of the screenshots from our first um, activity which you've seen some of um, on the video but um it's very bright very nice um and in our first year just um see see on presentation but things that we learned um included just that they the families and children responded really well to um working over zoom and doing the online activities um we were really really impressed and reassured when um you know, they all came to the session, they'd never met us before, um, but they, you know, seemed to talk really openly, they said they really enjoyed being in a group, they felt able to share things. Um, we had a mixture of school groups of um, children from the same school and some from mixed groups, um, and they seemed to work well, um, also that the children engaged really well. Um, and yeah, just as I said before, some families needed additional support to get on. Um, we, you know, we had lots of different variations of sort of children's um, older children attending in place of the parents and you know lots of different ways around um, some of the difficulties we're encountering but still managed to come um, and um, yeah we had a few glitches with the online activities um, which we hoping we can iron out for next year um, and just things regarding zoom we had to come up with sort of some children didn't want to put their cameras on at first but we actually found that it was really beneficial and they were also obviously safe safety aspects and managing risks we needed to be aware of you know who was with them at the time and this confidential space um so things such as that and i can't see what the last one is and yeah just um the parental engagement obviously was a huge huge part of it and um, contributed to you know whether the children were attending the groups or not and that was um, yeah very quickly and you're going to get the slides but it's not going to be any surprise to you know that we are committed to increasing our numbers next year and um, we did have fairly low numbers very COVID affected but we feel the children we had were the right children absolutely um, just keeping the links making sure we know that children have got laptops um, it's probably nice for you to see some of the feedback from the parents and the children in the next slide um, and just before we finish I mean our favorite is when we asked the children what they, how they would talk about the programme, what they would say about the programme to next year's cohort, one of them said, it gets rid of the butterflies in your tummy. That's got to be the standout quote, I think, from the, the whole programme for, for us. 
Um, but just also to say, you know, we let the children name their groups. Um, interesting names, the Resilient Musketeers. And I think this is a nice one to leave you with. We had a group of boys who decided to call themselves the delinquents. But as we went through the four sessions with them, they renamed themselves to the responsible grown up boys. And uh, so I think that's sort of our parting gift to the community on, online with us today, because I think that really speaks volumes to just where we got to with a group of children and parents that we never met. Um, and that's the sort of the, the highlight really, um, and the outstanding bit of this, that we have never met these children or their parents in person. Um, it's been an amazing experience. So um, yeah, sorry to go over time and to whistle through it, but hopefully you get an impression of our journey. Really fantastic, Laverne and Rachel. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, really powerful. And that example at the end was just really magical and illustrates so much of the brilliant work that you did and, you know, real testament to your agility and resilience in the face of you know, the term unprecedented times just doesn't quite do it justice, does it? But thank you both. And um, so, yeah, really inspirational as, um, you know, some of the comments coming through. And if people have any questions that you would like to ask of Laverne and Rachel, do please put them in the Q&A. Um, a bit easier to pick up questions within the Q&A um, section of the webinar, um, because uh, obviously comments come through on the chat. But if you do put them in the chat, that's fine. We'll still pick them up too. So let's take a break just now, just literally for a comfort break. Um, perhaps it's 04 now. If we come back at 09 to try and keep as close as we can to time, um, and um, we'll be welcoming NHS E and I. So thanks very much. Take a break and see you soon. Hopefully, you've all managed to um, have a bit of a comfort break in that few minutes. Um, so now we're pleased to be moving on to the next presentation. Just move the slide on. Um, So we're delighted to be working, uh, welcoming a team from NHS X to describe their work supporting the digital transformation in children and young people's mental health services. So there's um, a team of three who are going to be presenting and perhaps if I could leave it up to you guys to give your introductions to everybody on the webinar. Thanks very much. Oh, that's great. Yes, can you hear me? Can I just check? You can hear and see me, brilliant. Um, so thank you so much, Rachel. Um, my name's Nadia, and I'm one of a team of us who's on the call today. There's three of us um, as presenting panelists, uh, but there's also other other team members on the on the call because we're also interested to kind of dial in and and learn um, from the different presentations that have happened today. Uh, so I will just introduce myself and also um, our well. So I'm the program manager in the Children and Young People's Mental Health National Team. NHS e and I, and I've been um, working with Hilary Tovey uh, and Emma Story, who are also going to be presenting today. Um, do you are you guys available, and do you want to introduce yourselves? Hi, it's Emma here. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. I'm afraid uh, my video isn't working today, so you just have the joy of a a voice. So um, I'm Emma Story, I'm a project manager from within the digital mental health team at NHS England and Improvement. And since uh, the craziness of COVID started, I have been working very closely with NHS X on their COVID response um, for digital mental health and subsequently on the um, kickoff of the next phase of this um, CYP digital transformation project. Thank you, Emma. That's great. And um, I'm Hilary Tovey. Um, and I uh, head up the digital mental health team at NHS England and Improvement. And we're mainly working to uh, very closely alongside our colleagues uh, who lead in the programme areas, such as Nadia does in children, young people's mental health, to um, sort of in, in the belief and on the understanding that we think that digital transformation of services is one of the really important ways that we are going to meet our long term plan ambitions and sort of broader ambitions for improved mental health services. And to do that, we work very closely with our policy colleagues, but we also work very closely with um, uh, our colleagues, as Emma mentioned, over in NHSX, who, of course, are looking at that much broader 
transformation opportunity um, in, in terms of digital across the whole of the NHS. And what we're trying to do is take those big programmes of care that they're running, think here about the, the huge, the kind of significant interoperability programmes. Um, they've got a big programme on bookings, referrals and appointments management and, and getting, getting those uh, online. And what we're trying to do is to make sure that the mental health component of those works for our services. Uh, so working very closely, bringing together the kind of policy and the technical to try and uh, uh, create the sort of transformation that we think will help us deliver what we want to for uh, service users. Those were fantastic introductions and they both said it better than I could myself. Uh, so yeah, I've been working quite closely with Hilary and Emma um, on our children and young people's digital transformation programme and also my colleagues Jamie Lee and Sarah Brown are also on the call and possibly Alex Goforth. There's a team of us who are going to be really interested in what comes out of this discussion today. Um, it's been great hearing about the work to date and really um, it's a tough act to follow, sort of following level up. Um, but we just wanted to talk about, I guess, how we're viewing this work nationally, um, some kind of key messages that we wanted to share. But then we want to move into kind of presenting the work that we are doing with NHSX, which is really about supporting local areas with digital transformation and given the expertise of this group in delivering transformation uh, we're really keen to get people's views actually um, and just flag opportunities to get involved. I also need to apologise because my internet's cut out a few times so I've actually kind of been kicked out of the call because of that uh, so I might I'm so sorry if that happens uh, whilst I'm talking. Hopefully Hilary and Emma will be able to step in if that happens and apologies in advance guys if that's true. So if you could move on to the next slide, Neelam. Brilliant, yes, so we're gonna cover this in three steps. So um, digital transformation, why it's important to children and young people's mental health services. So thinking about the long-term plan and our overall objectives and strategy on, on this. Um, and then Emma's gonna talk us through the work that we have been doing with NHSX to date, um, given their expertise in digital and transformation, um, transformation expertise. And then Hilary is going to lead a kind of discussion about our next steps with you and opportunities to work together potentially. Uh, so next slide, please. Thank you. And probably the next one as well. So I'll start with talking about um, what do we mean by digital? And we've had some really kind of excellent um, instructions to the type of uh, technologies available by Rose um, at the beginning of this conference. And uh, really, it's it's a lot about that. So we're thinking about uh, the long term plan policy ambition overall for mental health, which is that by 2024, 100% of mental health providers should meet required levels of digitization and are integrated with other parts of the health and care system. Uh, for example, through a local shared health and health and care record platform. But also that local systems offer a range of self management apps digital consultations and digitally enabled models of therapy. And it's really this, this graph on the or sort of picture on the right is sort of demonstrating that we, when, we need, when we say digital, we're kind of talking about this whole range of capabilities that surrounds um, the individual staff member, the individual service user, the family, um, and, and how they contribute to a better experience of care and ultimately better outcomes. So really we're thinking about the suite of self um, apps and digital therapies available, but also some of the more infrastructural um, elements. So making sure that we have digital, digital assessment and records, um, tools to support decisions on care. Uh, so we've heard about the really kind of cutting edge of technology around machine learning to ident identify individual need. And also tools that can help staff really um, and to make best use of their time. So thinking about how to manage caseloads, um, use the data on the service to, uh, to visualize it and make decisions on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, as well as a strategic focus as well. So this slide sort of sets out some of those capabilities that we're referring to when we say digital. You can move on to the next slide, please. And what does this mean specifically for children and young people's mental health services? So this is actually a slide that um, NHSX usually present, and it, it kind of represents some of the uh, questions that they, they have received from um, the providers that they've worked with or just other kind of other providers in the system. 
And, and much of the conversation is around, we need a digital front end, which is really thinking about, um, I guess, people's first experience of a service and making sure that it is efficient um, and effective, gets them to the right support at the right time, which is really important. And I think we are keen to make sure that from the beginning, we're thinking about a whole pathway of care and a whole experience. And so we want to move away from thinking solely about that first part of the, um, of the pathway, which is really important, but kind of coupling it with what's the whole user experience. And by digital, we can kind of, we're referring to some of the, the approaches and the mindset that the private sector has used quite effectively um, to think about how people make decisions, how people um, uh, process information, um, what's important to people really to design the whole kind of experience of care. So it's not necessarily that we need to always commission an app, but it's thinking about actually what, how can we improve that experience of care? Um, and some of this slide sets that out. You can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. And uh, what we've seen over the last few months, and I, I recognize people in this call who, who have done this uh, substantially, which is that the pandemic has challenged us to accelerate that agenda. Um, though we saw an initial drop in referrals um, in the beginning of the COVID-19 um, period, we have seen acuity and complexity rise in the presentations that we do have. Um, my computer has just started doing something strange and I can't, it's just blank. So I'm just going to keep talking to what I know is on this slide until it figures itself out. Um, so, uh, but we have seen also that um, people have rapidly adapted and started offering um, different forms of, um, I'm just having to log back in again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, people have offered different forms of care that aren't face-to-face -to, -face to enable that continuation of care. And this graph on the right is from our early access data set, uh, early access to mental health services data set, which is our national data set. And it shows um, that kind of bottom blue bar, which is face-to-face -face communication dropped as a percentage of overall. And there was an increase in remote methods like telephone and telemedicine. Um, we are still working through how people are actually coding this and whether it is mostly telephone or if that's the kind of code that they're using for um, video consultations, for example. But we have seen just such a rapid transition and it's been fantastic to see. Um, if you can move on to the next slide, please. And I think what we've heard a lot of in this call is that um, we really have to think about the children and young people and families that you're working with and how they, what their preferences are because um, for a lot of people, um, remote consultations have worked really well because of the kind of reduced travel times, um, the ease of it, for example, but also for others, it, it hasn't worked. And we've got to think about digital inclusion, um, whether people have the space and privacy at home to um, access remote intervention, um, but also, um, you know, how are parents supported? Can they access peer support through some of these um, different modes? Also thinking about our workforce considerations where people need the skills and confidence to use technology, as well as kind of the ability to say when things aren't working and to feel like that's being taken into account by the service um, and feeling like you're part of the change that is happening. Um, I, I will probably move on because I'm conscious of time. You can move to the next slide, please. And I'll hand over to Emma now, who will kind of talk about the NHSX work. Great, um, would you mind just moving on to the next slide, please? Thank you. So yeah, I'm just going to talk briefly about the work that we've been um, doing with NHSX since mid-2019, which feels quite a long time ago now, when I was reviewing um, the work for the Discovery in Alpha, and there was talk of site visits and face-to-face -face, um, long conversations. I was, um, I was quite shocked. Um, so um, can I have the next slide, please? Excellent. So I'll just start by talking about the discovery work. So back in 2019, um, the Children Young People's Mental Health Team and the Digital Mental Health Team at NHS England partnered with um, the newly formed um, team within NHS X that were looking at digital transformation. We thought it would be an excellent opportunity to look at the pathway in a little bit 
differently. So to start off with um, looking at it in a discovery. And the aim of this discovery was to look at that, what opportunities there might be between referral to first appointment for um, improving the experience of children and young people um, when they are accessing CAM services. So um, what this screen is showing is a, um, is a journey map of how um, a, a children or young person might sort of work their way through the service and then plotted against that are the pain points and opportunities that came out um, through the research of the discovery. Um, as I was saying right at the beginning, the discovery um, research was um, happened in quite a lot of different ways in comparison to how we can do discovery research now. They did a mixture of site visits, um, interviews with children and young people, um, interviews with parents and carers, and I, they also did several in-depth interviews with um, professionals within the service and surveying techniques, along with secondary research into what research had been done to date on how the care pathway works and the opportunities there might be for to improve it. Um, so the diagram is really small, so I'm just going to pull out um, a few points in it to just highlight um, what was found in the discovery. So um, I'm going to take the awareness and on the left side. Um, so that just shows there that the pain points are that sometimes children, young people and their parents and carers aren't really sure how to access services. They're not really sure where to go. And as um, Nadia referenced earlier, there's a need for some digital presence um, that allows parents and carers and children and young people to just find out a little bit more about what services are on offer. And the little green boxes below, that again, I'm not unlikely to be able to see actually on, on the presentation, are just highlighting that that could be an area for further research and looking into that it might be around how to create that, um, that offer um, to build awareness of CAM services and how it might be useful to the young people. So I think that was all I wanted to highlight on this side. Can I go on to the next slide, please? Yes, yeah, so um, the as the discovery concluded, um, the team pulled together their top areas where they thought there were opportunities to improve the service um, towards from that beginning awareness offer to the point before their first appointment. Um, going from that digital um, front door, which is often called, to personalised um, notifications. And so these were pulled out, as you can see, and then were we looked at forming an alpha around the learnings that we'd found in the discovery. So next slide, please. Yeah, so trusts were um, invited to... Um, seek for funding for their digital transformation projects and how and we look to how they might align to those different areas that we pulled out as areas for opportunity and as you can see here um, the successful trusts um, are across the country and looking into those different areas from um, Surrey and Borders that was looking at digital self-referral, Oxley's that were looking at how to deliver virtual support before first appointment um, and then to Camden that was looking at um, reinvigorating their digital presence um, and awareness. So um, since late 2019, we've been working with these sites and um, NHSX has been supporting them in their projects. As you can imagine, if this only launched in late 2019, we were also um, interrupted with COVID. So um, as, as you can understand, every, everyone's projects were interrupted and we have recently picked up with all of our stream um, two sites and we're starting to pick up with our stream one sites and having incredibly insightful conversations about how their projects have been altered and shifted, sometimes accelerated, other times paused due to COVID. Um, next slide, please. So this just gives a little bit of a flavour of what it was like in that pre-COVID world to do um, alpha research that included um, prototyping, ser service mapping, um, collating ideas from um, service users and professionals and presenting them very visually um, within the services. Um, next slide, please. And this just also highlights that um, some of the artifacts that were created in the alpha were journey maps and service blueprints, which are incredibly useful um, resources in trying to just understand how the service is working at the moment and how it could work in the future 
And also the service blueprint is really useful um, artifact for showing how it might not work just in that service, but how you might be able to blueprint that model of um, delivering care and um, allowing others to see how their services might work to the same blueprint. Next slide, please. And also one of the other interesting things that came out of the Alpha project was um, two of the sites prototyped different um, forms of digital service. So you can see on the left that um, Oxley's created a chatbot style um, text messaging service prototype that allowed really quick feedback from users into what kind of messages they would want to get before accessing a service. And then the slightly smaller photos, which is really hard to see, but those are showing a prototype that was developed by Surrey um, in consultation with a digital supplier um, that was, you could really quickly put in front of users and get a sense of which kind of design they preferred, what they wanted on the home screen. I think this particular prototype was looking at how you parents can request a callback from um, a professional, how they can self-refer and um, parents' entry point for referrals and access. Um, next slide, please. So the alpha work is still ongoing um, because of the delays to the projects um, due to COVID, but we've, we were able to get enough out of the different sites projects and um, some work we were also doing with FutureGov earlier this year to start to build a service model, um, which Hilary will talk more about in a second. So the, it's the idea that we can create some generic resources to be able to help um, services and teams think about how they might attempt and attack um, delivering their service transformation, um, going from how you might start with a vision and then how you create hypotheses look to test those hypotheses, get to prototyping those hypotheses um, quickly, and then how to engage other teams, their leadership and their users in this transformation activity. So I'm gonna now pass to Hilary, who is going to talk about how we are looking at taking this work forward into um, developing generic resources that might support everyone. Great, thank you, Emma. And um, uh, can I have the next slide, please? So the next phase of our work is uh, to develop a range of resources to make it as easy as possible for people to use inclusive service design approaches to deliver digital transformation across children, young people's mental health services. So I think what M has described um, is thinking about using that sort of discovery, the design thinking to think about the whole of your pathway. So we're not just thinking about individual interventions, sorry, I think my camera's frozen, um, but not just thinking about individual uh, uh, sort of uh, digital projects, but actually thinking about this as a, as a digital pathway as a whole. Um, and, and not least because, as Rose mentioned right at the staff meeting, there's a huge number of digital tools now that are available. And actually what we want services to start thinking about is how are we going to integrate some of those tools into our service? What does our service need to look like? Um, and, and, and as Emma it, it explained, we do that by do it going into these discovery phrases, phases, thinking about including user research within that, thinking about um, you know, how do you engage your staff within that, and actually making it a whole design process. Um, and so um, the resources that we're going to uh, uh, develop will build on the work that Emma outlined. And, um, and what we're working towards is thinking about what a digital transformation roadmap looks like for children and young people. And so this is going to involve a, a, a sort of number of resources, as I mentioned. So there will be a knowledge pack. So this will use blueprints, templates, case studies. And the intention is to help us to guide others uh, and to help them to undertake similar activities. Um, and then on top of that, there'll be an implementation manual and guidelines on how to uh, run design activities, so thinking about the de different delivery approaches that people might use to, um, to recreate this work. But then we'll also be thinking about the practical support that's needed to develop capability across the teams and um, to use the resources that we make here available to deliver digital transformation. So we're really pleased because we've secured quite a bit of money from NHSX to help deliver this work over the next few months. Um, but what we're really keen to do is to work uh, is is to get your support to make sure that this work is actually relevant, valuable and appropriate as well. Um, so on the next slide, we've got some questions for discussion. 
And what we'd really like to do today um, is to understand from you, uh, and sorry, these questions are on the next slide. Um, so the, the, the few sort of practical questions at first, um, and the first one is just how do we best engage with services? So um, it would be really great if people want to write in the chat, um, uh, and, and then and then Nadia is just going to have a look at that as it comes through. So if you just really think, so if we if you reflect on what Emma has shown you um, today, thinking about the work that we've done already in the trusts, actually what we're keen to do is to think about how can we help spread this not this knowledge. So I think thinking not just about the digital transformation work that you've done, but also other transformation work and how this has worked well. So how can we engage with the services? It own, is only going to work if we do this with you and not to you. Um, and, and I suppose the first question really is, are people interested in getting involved in this work just to kind of gauge the level of support? And how can we best make this easy for you to do that? And then the second question is, so who do we need to talk to within the service? So I think this is probably an extension of the kind of how, but who should we be talking to? I think there's a that's an assumption that anything that's digital always has to go through CCIOs. But I think what we've heard today is that isn't the case. And actually, the, 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 what we're seeing is we need to engage with the teams who are thinking about transformation more generally. So it's not just about the digital um, services. It's not it, it's not just about the sort of the, the people who are who are the digital people. We've actually it's actually the people who are wanting to do service change that we really need to be um, targeting with this, so that they then have tools that they can use within their general transformation activities. <coughs> um, and then I suppose the other question is just what's the role of the S STPs and the ICSs in this, in your view? So, <laughs> what is it that they need to know? Not not only because of their position as commissioners. Um, uh, but but also thinking um, about the fact that some of these solutions that we need, some of the ways that we can really make services integrated and joined up, um, is um, is if we get the ICSs and, and the STPs involved, because there are some things that we need to do at the system level that don't that won't, won't <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that won't work if we try and do it just at the service level. <coughs> so I'll just pause for a minute um, while I have a coughing fit. <coughs> So you can have a think about this question. Thanks so much, Hilary. And um, you've actually already had a great point made by Emilios um, in the chat that I can start to read out whilst um, whilst you, sorry, you have been coughing a fit, but you've got some uh, water nearby. Uh, so hi there, Hilary, Nadia and Emma. One of the problems we're facing is quite fundamental and NHSC could help. Supporting trusts, developing digital products to navigate issues of digital ethics particularly when commissioning large cloud-based suppliers who are not forthcoming or being open about how they use the very sensitive data they are storing. This is from a data sensitivity perspective, EDI perspective and sustainability. Thank you, Emilia. Thanks, Emilia, for sharing that. I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. And actually, that's something that uh, I don't think has, has come up so far in the work that we've been doing, possibly because we've just been at the prototyping stage. Um, but I know that um, certainly there are lots of conversations about IG, uh, but I, at, at the moment from the centre, but I don't know that that's necessarily extended as far as the kind of digital um, ethics and the cloud-based based suppliers. We do, um, there is a new NHSX has just um, introduced a new digital technology assessment criteria, which does look at things like data security. I'm not sure if that includes a question or a commitment from those suppliers that they will um, uh, conform to certain requirements as far as data sharing is concerned, but uh, that's certainly something that we can look into. I suppose, uh, I think the question that we were really asking was about digital transformation and whether, and who's doing this at the moment. So who's, you know, I know, Emilia, you, you've got quite a lot of uh, kind of transformation activities that involve digital services um, in, in your service, but is this something that we're seeing whole scale? The, 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 the slides that um, Emma shared, is that something that resonates? Do people recognise the kind of discovery approach? Um, are people looking at whole pathways? Um, and if not, kind of how, how can we help support that to happen from the centre? I'm not too sure if you can see the comments in the Q&A, Hilary, but there's, um, uh -huh. there's a couple from Dawn Clark who says that she suggests um, you target pathways that are currently under review. So there, there are a number of pathways already 
um, in place. So um, the national programs that they're that are being undertaken at the moment. So NHS 111 and vaccination programs. And that uh, another comment is that there are a number of issues that people face from diverse backgrounds and lack of knowledge, equipment and access to the internet. And she highlights that Lancashire and South Cumbria have a great digital collaborative and it might be worth having a conversation uh, with Linda Vernon. And um, so yes. some tips from Dawn there within it that might be useful to you. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. And yes, yeah, sorry, I just spotted the Q&A as well as the chat. <laughs> so switching between the two, um, and and some, some really good thoughts here about um, uh, provider interviews and the quarterly meetings. So uh, I think that's really positive. Um, and uh, some sort of consume on-demand training opportunities to connect with other providers. And I think that's one of the key things. So we, we've been working with the uh, AHSNs a bit to think about how we can share learning across the AHSNs. There's a lot of work that's happening locally and actually we're thinking how can we scale that so that we have bringing that learning back into the centre as well. Um, uh, but it'd be great I think if, if you know this network is one of the places that we can come to um, to try and uh, get some support particularly as we develop those resources but, um, but yeah some really helpful thoughts there thank you. So I think the, 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 um, the second question really was just uh, of the resources we've brought through, talk through uh, what is uh, sort of most valuable in these, um, and and also is there an effective way for us to roll out skills development with services? And Nadia, did you want to add anything to those two two points? Because I think it's going to, much of this work is going to be sort of developed through your teams, isn't it? Yes. So I think I've also just seen a couple of really kind of helpful points from. Um, from colleagues around how we can actually engage and support with people. So I guess in terms of a, the practical perspective, we are hoping to start this work early next year and there will be a team um, hired through NHSX who will be kind of driving this work, working closely with us and we're, we will be kind of uh, managing their connection with services and making sure that we actually can run those um, engagements. And I can see that, for example, um, L Brown, who has um, written in the chat, has said, I think setting up provider interviews would be a great place to start and running quarterly meetings. I think we've already um, talked to that point, Hilary. Um, and I think people have also said that STPs and ICSs need to be engaged on that because of their role, I guess, in um, forming their digital strategies. We've also, yeah. I guess, in the CYPMH team, we've had a few other... Um, We've got experience of rolling out various skills support programs and iThrive does that itself as well. So I guess any um, any wisdom that people can share about what they thought has worked well, given that we know people are really stretched and there's something about how do you make um, sort of skill support capability building and resources um, most uh, appropriate in terms of how people can access that and, and digest it and apply it. Um, alongside their day jobs. Well, I think t t um, Tim Glock's made a really important point here that um, it, this isn't necessarily an area that people feel comfortable with. Yeah. Um, and actually, um, there's, there's, you know, there's, while while we've seen this um, transformation to digital and remote ways of working, actually, perhaps we haven't seen as much of that whole pathway development. Uh, not least because a lot of the digital innovation we've seen over the last month has been in response to a need because we have to, rather than thinking about how we want to. And I think this is what we're really trying to do with this programme, isn't it, Nadia, is to think about much, sort of much broadly across the board, actually, what is it we want to keep and why? And, and what does that kind of digital ecosystem look like? So building a whole pathway around um, digital tools. And I think, as Emma used some of the examples, a lot of that was about communicating um, with service users outside of sessions and actually making that part of the pathway work better so that by the time people do come to their appointments they're fresher they haven't been beaten down by the system they also they've got the information that they need they feel they're much more involved in their services as well so it's much more of a kind of holistic view um, and um, so yeah I think think really helpful to think to to recognize that actually some of this is quite new and although we feel we've been doing a lot of digital recently, quite a bit of that, as um, I think uh, maybe Rose mentioned earlier, is business unusual, but just through a computer screen, which perhaps isn't exactly what we're talking about here when we think about whole scale digital transformation. Um, really important role for the third sector as well has come up in these comments too. 
uh, and I and I know that we feel that particularly for uh, children, young people's mental health services, don't we, Nadia? Definitely, and I think that's we've got a wider kind of piece of work at the moment about around participation, and a lot of that is about how you continue effective participation and co-production digitally. Um, it's because it, you know, there are benefits to it even in kind of a steady state, no COVID world, because more people can engage through those processes. Um, so I think that's a brilliant, um, a brilliant point that we need to learn from our voluntary care sector partners. Uh, and then one final point I was just going to pick up, which is about the ICSs as well. So thank you for that, which is recognising that actually ICSs is the place where a lot of decisions are being made about platforms. Um, and so really important to make sure that we've got that connection between the services and the ICS. Um, and, I, and this is something that we hear across mental health pathways. Sometimes decisions are made at the ICS level about platforms because they work for the whole system. And actually, how is it that we can ensure that mental health services are involved enough in those conversations so actually the decisions that are being made are relevant for the services that we're trying to deliver as well so some really helpful comments here i think there are some and, um, i'm going to offer from l brown for you to link directly so um they put their email address oh. in the chat uh for you to pick up outside of here as well so and okay. uh, just to say that one of the ways that we um that, that what the Perhaps the ITRAD community of practice could be helpful to you is that what can be useful is to set up forums with specific topic areas and it might be that um, setting up a digital forum within the community of practice could be something you might want to think about and we could absolutely support you with and engage our um, nationwide group in that um, and invite them to join so uh, we could we could have a conversation about that as well offline if there's um, interest in taking that idea forward too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm mindful of time and there might be further questions um, to come, um, but we are due to move now into the Q&A slot um, where we can um, invite all our presenters to, um, to join. And whilst they're, they're doing that, um, could you please add any questions or reflections that you do have in, in the chat? And there's a number of... Um, I've got a highlight on my Q&A of the, a number of statements within that, so I'll, I'll review that as well. But do add any questions to any of the um, presenters. There was one um, for Rose around the use of outcome measures digitally, which we um, will need to pick up. And, um, and I'm sure that other participants have some experience of using outcome measures digitally. So do please add any comments in relation to that into the chat, um, but perhaps should we start with um, Jamie? I'm not too sure what um, what your question, Jamie Lee, um, what your question was. Um, what's her? Ex what's Rose's experience of the use of outcome measures? Um, and I think from Rose's experience, um, we are pulling all the data together. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rose, but it's from um, the experiences of different uh, sites in using outcome measures. So you're, in your role specifically, you're not collecting outcome measures, but certainly it's something that we've been struggling with and we've seen a significant reduction in the collection of our outcome um, measures. Uh, okay, outcome measures in the digital arena. Um, so Rose, do you want to comment on the information that you provided in the initial slide? Yeah, I think I was really trying to kind of uh, think about in terms of outcome measures that again we're such in a very early stage in our transition that we've got, you know, we haven't the outcome measures that we're using are still often the same I think the CBT work that I talked about are using sleep diaries and stuff but it's more about having a kind of real-time measure um, for the data and it's about trying to have uh, you know the idea is that moving digitally we can get a kind of more people are able to access the therapies and services so there's the potential to have a you know larger data pool and I think that was mostly what I was talking about you know in terms of data donors as well that you know, we are able to reach out to more people and get more um, data that can inform the outcome measures that we have. I, th I think, I don't know if anybody else wants to kind of contribute to that. That was the main point that I was really making on that, I think. Thanks, Rose. Um, and I think that um, it might be helpful, Jamie Lee, to point you in the direction of Cork, who've done some really fantastic, developed some really fantastic resources about uh, the use of outcome measures digitally through COVID. So do have a look at, at their website. Um, but I know personally within our organisation, it's something that we're grappling with because there's a significant reduction in the completion of outcome measures uh, through COVID times. Okay, um, so 
So just moving to the Q and A, I don't know, uh, Bethan and Neelam, are you one of you in a better position to be able to navigate um, the chat? And I'll just pick out some of the questions on oh Q and A. I think we've gone through. Uh, so there's a couple of comments, um, Hilary, for you from um, participants, just to uh, for you to pick up, and we can copy those for you and share them with you. Um, and then we move to the chat. So Jamie Lee said, I was hoping you might have secretly cracked it. Sadly not, no magic wand there, but um, keen to think more about how we can we can improve our outcomes absolutely digitally. And I think it's also important to um, link with our webinar last month in relation to the work that um, we are doing to develop um, system-wide outcomes frameworks and, um, and Greater Manchester presented their work last month and we're in the process of developing an implementation story um, to support uh, other sites across the country in thinking about the cross-sector outcomes frameworks um, which obviously need to be led locally um, but to share learning from that so that might be something Jamie Lee you'd, you'd like to um, link with us about further after this webinar. Okay um, so um, yes the uh, the recording will be made available to all participants um, so that question has just popped into the chat. Now I've not um, uh, oh, so Tim has said that he'd like to, he'd be keen to link with any outcomes work using digital. Great. Uh, thanks, um, Tim. We will, uh, perhaps we could, that could be another helpful forum, actually. Um, maybe we could think about one of our webinars. We could invite Cork uh, to um, work with us around a, a digital webinar, if that's of interest. Um, so that, that's absolutely something we can take forward from, from this. And Tim, perhaps we, uh, great. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. So yeah, uh, if there are other areas of um, particular strands of work that have been touched on today that people would like us to follow up on, do please pop that into the chat. And that's really helpful for us in, in steering um, our thoughts around future webinars. So Neelam's very kindly included the link for the webinar of um, the presentation that, um, sorry, that we did last time where GM presented their work and um, the discussions around the development of the um, whole system outcomes framework um, within Greater Manchester. So do please have a look at that. Um, and maybe Jamie Lee, that might be something to, to pick up um, out, outside of here as well. So Bethan and Neelam, are, are you able to give any um, comments on some of the uh, points raised in the chat? Just because um, you might have an easier way of navigating. Um, yeah, just well, some comments in the Q and A that um, I don't know whether have been addressed um, fully. So thinking about the kind of the digital um, presentation, um, Freddie said about um, in terms of support to providers with value, some consume on demand training as well as opportunities to connect with other providers working in this space. And it would be interesting to hear if that is something that's been thought about as well. And then also thinking about linking with non-health parties as well. Perhaps Nadia and Hilary, that probably, and Emma. Yeah, yeah sorry, I was just coming off mute. Uh, and I think I've frozen again. <laughs> so I'm right. I don't know, the weather seems to have an effect on my uh, connectivity. I don't know why. Um, uh, but yes, I mean, absolutely. And a lot of uh, the um, people who, uh, oh, sorry, I've turned the video off, totally frozen. Um, but a, a lot of our colleagues over at NHSX have come from non health sectors and actually are. are um, bring that knowledge with them and there is a lot of learning I think that's coming across from the non-health sectors at, at that level um, but I think it, you're absolutely right there is some you know if you think about how you run your life uh, we run our lives so digitally uh, except in the health service um, and, um, and and there's an awful lot of learning I think that we can pull through uh, to that and, and not least actually thinking about the user journey and the user pathway and there's some of the work that we've been trying to do with NHSX very much um, um, our models that are used elsewhere to think about how you can improve I don't know websites how people interact with their banking websites thinking about service patterns if you notice when you fill in a form online actually it's usually you know structured in the same way because that's how people find it easy to use so there's quite a lot of examples that are kind of being pulled through from, from non-health as well in terms of training, yes, that's very much on the list of things that we're keen to do, uh, thinking about capabilities, not least for digital transformation, but we've also got a programme of work we're doing with HEE, which is looking at digital skills more generally. Um, so, and particularly thinking about how those need to and could be tailored for mental health settings, 
So if you look at go through HE resources at the moment, there's an awful lot for digital that's available for primary care. It's the same skills uh, in a lot of the cases that we need between primary care and mental health. But for some reason, they look like they're just designed specifically for people working within a primary care setting. So, um, uh, yeah, so so absolutely trainings there. But also it's, it's broader than just being able to use a an app or a or a computer or a, a platform. It's much what we're really looking at, I think, with our work is thinking about how can we teach or teach you? How can we share learning? about those design skills and thinking about um, particularly thinking about the, the sort of agile methodology and how that applies across design thinking um, thinking about how we can start thinking about doing you know sort of a prototyping and alpha and beta um, because that's really the way that where previous digital projects have been run again across health and non-health sectors that's the way this sort of iterative innovation that applies to digital and, and digital uh, pathways of care I think that's what we're really keen to get people to thinking about that in a slightly different way and, and thinking about how technology has a role to play in, in, in transforming the care that we're giving, as well as how to use the tools that need to sit behind that as well. Does that help answer the question? Freddie, um, that was a query from you, I think, wasn't it? Does that, does that help? I'm sure it does. Um, but if there's anything more that you would like um, clarified, and um, particularly in relation to, I suppose, you know, the, the training that might be available as and when, um, perhaps we could share that also through our community of practice newsletter, um, which goes out on a monthly basis. So do um, link that, um, link us in with that information because we can help with dissemination across, across this group. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, just checking a couple of things within the Q&A, all oh, the multitasking agility that we now need to have. Um, <laughs> So yeah, Freddie, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, great. Can I just um, flag, sorry, Rachel. Can yeah. I just flag that a couple of people have mentioned um, access issues and ensuring that, you know, access to technology and and all of these things is, is ensuring that the service that we still provide is equitable. Um, and that's something that, yeah, especially translating over to digital means where there is actual like financial things that come into it as well. And even during COVID, when before people were accessing, um, you know, IT equipment and that sort of thing in, in libraries and other forms, all of that's been con completely unable. And just being aware that, you know, equity and access to services is such a huge issue within healthcare anyway. Um, and how much harder this is for some people during this. And I, I know Laverne and Rachel talked earlier about, um, you know, moving into year two, about providing equipment for, for some of the the children they're working with and it's incredibly you know they're incredibly fortunate to be able to do that but that's not always the case so um yeah like i think it's just something to consider something to carry on on asking for as well within organizations and continue to raise um to ensure that yeah we're, we're considering equality and equity specifically brilliant thank you very very helpful reminder Nina. i'm sorry hillary are you going to respond no, I was just going to say, I think it's such an important point, but actually also this is an area where we've seen some real innovation over the last few months as well. So there's some really lovely examples of where people not only are using resources to give um, uh, technology to ensure that people have access to the technology they need, but also I think it's out in um, uh, East London, they set up these, uh, they, they're using all of their consulting rooms that are too small to have two people in at an appropriate social distance and they've turned those into sort of computer rooms so that service users can come in and um, use the touchscreen computer to to, to uh, have their consultation and then and then leave again and it's incredibly easy and set up for them um, we've been working with the nhs confederation and the association of mental health providers and they've got a toolkit that's coming out uh in next week i think it is which just sort of tries to set out a few kind of practical things for trust to think about when they're considering inclusion and that's being co-produced with service users as well but it might be interesting to think about how that specifically applies to the children young people's population as well because i think this is looking across services i think i think the focus is mainly it has mainly been on adults but it might be quite interesting to explore how that specifically applies within this setting too yeah and a very helpful reminder from dawn clark within the chat that um there are people who will never utilise digital technology and we do need to be mindful of that as well in the delivery of equitable services. So thank you very much. Great. 
Um, we've got just got a couple of minutes left. We would really like to take this opportunity to get your feedback. As you know, um, working remotely, as we've spoken about, is not without its challenges. So any constructive comments about the webinar today will be gratefully received. I'll hand over to Bethan and Neelam um, to, um, to gain that. So if you could all go to Menti, Menti, no. <laughs> I'm webinar out. Um, if you could all go to www.menti.com and use the code 449889 and just um, share your view on how helpful the webinar was for you as a first question. Let me leave that one on because if we move while well, people just join. If we move on, we lose the potential to capture the data. So some of the challenges of digital working, it's not always um, possible to, to move in real time. We have to wait for people to action things. Okay, so we've got, we've got 10 comments. I'm sure we can probably get a few more. We've, we've still got 29 people on the webinar, so we would be really grateful um, for your feedback. A couple of new messages just come in while people do that. Oh, it's the menti.com uh, and the code. Okay, if we can get to 20, I'll probably be happy. So a few more people, <laughs> if you could really push to, uh, to give um, your feedback on, on the webinar, it'd be really, really helpful to us. I mean, it looks like overall it has been helpful. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that's not just a bias of people seeing what people have said. And if it's not been helpful to you, please do also share. Don't feel that you have to give the same feedback as everybody else. Um, and um, okay, we're almost there. 19, if there's one more person to give, uh, somewhat helpful. Thank you. Thank you to that person who's uh, booked the trend. That's really helpful. We've got 20, so we can move on to the next. Um, Next one. Are there any particular areas that were helpful to you? So out of what was covered today, what was it that was um, particularly helpful? If you just take a couple of minutes just to give any comments, that would be much appreciated. Level up, that's particularly helpful, it's good to know. Thank you to Laverne and Rachel. We've had some positive feedback about uh, hearing examples, learning about the Level Up work, being able to hear updates and chat, raise issues. Last presentation, opportunities for digital work. Um, oh, Sarah, my system's stuck and can't move to give feedback. So Sarah, if you're welcome to give your feedback um, uh, either in the chat or um, if you want to email ithriveinfo, that would be really great. It'd be great to get as much feedback as we can. Um, so continue to give any areas that were helpful, because of course, inevitably, we're going to move on to um, to try and get your feedback about oh areas for development, or I don't know what the actual language is. If we move on to the any areas that could be improved. Or also, um, we won't have another slide because we only get three Menti questions. So if there's any areas that, um, that you would have liked to have seen covered, uh, please include that as well. So any areas for improvement and anything you would like to be covered. This is all anonymous, so please be as honest as you can be. We really want to hear your feedback about ways that we can improve these webinars. Breakouts around topics, yeah. That has come up before. So some, whoever's put that idea um, in there about breakouts and topics, um, we'd really like to know uh, whether you'd be happy for the webinars to be extended. Because part of the challenge, I think, in uh, the remote delivery is uh, in maximising people's engagement, participation and attention during these webinars. And, uh, and a bit of a, some people feedback that too much time is a, is a challenge to commit to. And we've seen the numbers drop significantly throughout the course of the webinar initially started off higher. So um, uh, any thoughts around how we might be able to do that would be really much appreciated. Please continue to give your comments. I'm aware that we're 
at time. Uh, we'll be still able to capture your feedback on um, ways that we could improve these webinars, as well as any ideas that you might have for future um, events. And um, we'll, we will now, though, draw the webinar to a close. I'm sure you've all got things to go to, but the um, Menti will remain open. So please do um, continue with that feedback. And I just want to say again, a huge thank you to all our colleagues who've presented today. So Rose, Neelan, Nadia, Emma, Hilary, Rachel and Laverne. Thank you all hugely. Um, and of course, to the iTribe programme team, to Beth, Bethan and Neelan are the ones who really do the work behind these webinars. So a huge thank you to them. Uh, for their fantastic skills, without whom this would not be possible. Um, but thank you all for your participation as well. Really great to see you all. And we look forward to seeing you in the new... No, we're not doing one in the new year. Uh, we're going to be doing... Our next event will be in February, and we'll be sharing that with the community of practice through the newsletters. Um, and we may well prioritise some of the comments that we've been receiving today, such as the outcomes. We'll keep you posted and look forward to seeing you in February. Thanks very much. And bye-bye. Bye, all. -bye. Bye,